Okay. Okay, I think it's 6.30 p.m. in the U.S., 6.30 a.m. here in Hong Kong and China. Um, so I think we'll, we'll begin on time. Other people, I'm sure you have lots of panels to all attend. Um, I'd like to thank you all very much for being with us this evening, this morning, uh, tonight, depending on, on where you are. And uh, for this session on reinventing education for rural regions, extremely important, obviously, as we come back from COVID-19 COVID in, in particular. And I'll just introduce um, uh, the panelists that I'm delighted to have uh, with us here today. Uh, Sandeep Pachpande, who's chairman of ASM Group of Institutes in India. Uh, Daniel Zaretsky, who is co-founder of World Influences Network in Uzbekistan. Shriram Bharat, the founder of Kuzabyoshara in Kenya. And Kathleen Delasky, founder of um, Education, Design Lab in the USA. So a wonderful, wide ranging group and we are absolutely delighted to have you. If I might start by asking you all um, the obvious question, which is really the COVID question, which has brought um, online education and digital education into homes that perhaps hadn't even considered it in both the Western world and uh, well beyond. So we would love to know a little bit about your experience. And in particular, the discussion today will be centered on secondary and post-secondary education, which I think is the space that a lot of our panelists are in. So while I know that perhaps beyond this discussion, uh, there's been a lot of talk about uh, younger children, um, our discussion today is, is a little bit beyond that. So tell us a little bit about um, how COVID was, uh, what went well, perhaps let's start with that. Kathleen, maybe you can tell us in the US, what's the good news story out of all of this? Well, I think the good news story, so we, we at the Education Design Lab, we focus nationally on creating new models for college, for post-secondary education, particularly looking at uh, ways to serve learners for whom college was not invented. So that would include rural students, uh, which classifies about 14% of the population in the U.S. And I would say what went well this year is, um, is, is two things. Number one, um, high schools and colleges were forced to obviously hack uh, solutions to figure out how to bring how to bring digital learning experiences to people to, in, in this region for most of whom were not were not getting it previously and so education deserts people don't live close to the to the uh, to the colleges, and so there's there's been a, a an increased uh, awareness and and funding. We just got a huge uh, piece of funding uh, to the colleges uh, across the country, and and these are the kinds of uses uh, to, that uh, that colleges will be able to spend these dollars on. So so that those are good things. And the other the other I want to mention one thing, which is a mindset that has changed. You know, all of us, including everybody in my office, right? We're still working remotely. It's been one year now. And um, there, there's a new there's a new acceptance among employers of, of remote working, obviously around the world, uh, uh, and 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 what and what that's meant for rural regions where the um, where where access to employment opportunities for you know college uh, graduates or community college graduates um, was was very problematic. People had to leave those regions to get jobs. We are working with a number of employers who are now saying, okay. We see a fabulous opportunity for workforce and training partners in the colleges in rural regions, and we are we are now uh, getting comfortable with remote work. And so there are new employment opportunities and national employers who are looking to connect with rural workers. Um, the problem, of course, there is connectivity and making sure that it's good enough uh, for people to really you know do the job they need to do uh, from from afar. Shriram, what about the glass half empty? What, what, you know, perhaps from an emerging market perspective in particular, but in general, what hasn't gone quite so well? No, so I come from Africa and where our target audience are the informal communities, mostly the rural communities in agriculture and farming and other businesses. So we have seen that the extreme conditions are a fertile soil for extreme innovation. 
during these extreme times of covid we've actually managed to grow our network by 10 times oh. and what we wanted to do in 2022 we managed to achieve in 2020 and the way we went about doing it is to make the content made available for the informal communities especially our target audience are the 500 million plus small holder farmers who are completely disconnected from the rest of the world so what we managed to do is to get a lot of good agriculture practices and the ways in which one can do good uh, agriculture made available in bite sized learning nuggets and short videos and we have a very portable digital kit i'm not too sure if you're able to see so this is a device in which we make all of this content available and this is the device that is going to the rural masses in a backpack and up to 40 people within the range of 40 meters can connect to this even without internet and this is how we manage to democratize access and make this available for people and of course the constraints of covid that you know social distancing and other things and this is where now we we also had to go back to the drawing board and innovate the way people are learning and people are getting connected explain to us how the device works it's a, it's it's a, it's actually just content right it's not a, a it's not a wifi router or anything no like it is it's a, it's an interesting question that you asked lara so this is a this creates an intranet in a way the entire digital content of the digital platform is sitting inside this and this device travels mm-hmm. so this is a device made available in the rural communities and when you create when you power it on it creates a hotspot in the range of 40 meters and we also keep them at community centers and places where people with their device can actually come and connect to it and that's how they are able to access so this is how we are able to meet the challenge of lack of internet and lack of power and other things i think we'll come back to that because obviously that's a big challenge for everyone on this call in yeah. slightly different ways but maybe um daniel and sandeep it's sandeep maybe i'd start with you so out of all of this a lot of us will be taking lessons from covid um whatever part of the industry you are in and whatever part of the education system i wondered for you have a very wide range of students that you cater for um from the very young to to the the, the to the um young at heart um can you give us a sense of what you think the main lessons are and what you think we take away from what has really been the world's greatest um online experiment online learning experiment um see uh, see uh, well, obviously it's been mixed reactions to the different age groups and uh, in india uh, when the lockdown started it's been almost a year we are yet in a lockdown so we have not been able to open the colleges as yet uh, the biggest challenge had been um, adapting to the new normal uh, especially in terms of the digital divide which really exists so uh, not all the uh, students have laptops uh, uh, the mobiles or smartphones are shared within the family and uh, having bigger families smaller homes uh, you don't get the right places or the right corners even quiet corners in the houses to study as such but uh, we found that um, the students adapted very quickly to this uh, the teachers took some training but um, what we found is um, uh, as uh, sri ram said Uh, i think um, people innovate in a crisis more uh, as such and uh, we found that uh, we could do a lot of things at scale with the online once everyone adapted uh, like uh, earlier we used to do teacher training for maybe uh, 200 300 teachers at the most but mm-hmm. a few of the programs we did we had more than 8 and 9000 to uh, teachers uh, joining our training programs mm-hmm. Uh, not only from india you know we got people from uh, across the world c- coming and joining our teacher training programs uh, like uh, how to develop case studies and how to teach them online uh, as such so uh, the challenges were uh, really uh, in terms of the assessment because um, how to take the exams uh, when when you're not really uh, present but uh, uh, what we did was uh, we quickly adapted to some of the platforms uh, which were providing these facilities and many of the universities uh, in india since the numbers are very very high uh, they shifted to moving to the multiple choice questions <laughs> so that uh, it becomes easier for the students and the results come out quickly as such uh, so um, uh, you know and uh, what we started doing very quickly is uh, we came up with new curriculums uh, which were required during this period 
and giving those small modules to the teachers as well as to students to quickly adapt to the new things and uh, new courses in, like in agribusiness and emerging technologies and pharmaceuticals management have taken off extremely well. Daniel, what about from your perspective, Daniel? You have a quite a different perspective and I think we, we spoke last time that you have a bit of an urban-rural divide, which has obviously created some very specific challenges in, in COVID. Uh, yes, thanks. Uh, thanks, Clara. I just make a caveat that I've actually been spending the pandemic at home in New York already 15 months, mm -hmm. and I was in the process of moving from Tajikistan to Uzbekistan. So I'll just give a quick thing is we're opening a university in Uzbekistan called Ilumata University to solve some of these problems of getting education to the lesser, let's say, the, the bottom and the middle of the pyramid in the rural areas. So the caveat is this is going to be an online uh, primarily affordable university with many campuses in the regions uh, that would be test student, uh, testing, tutoring, study centers, maker spaces, incubators. So yes, I mean, one of the big, big problems we have is the urban-rural divide. And it, it in Uzbekistan, it manifests itself in a number of ways because 50% uh, of people in Uzbekistan live in rural areas. And the country is 133rd in mobile internet speed and 95th for fixed broadband. So actually, one of the things is 100% of population has digital TV. So most of the universities are in the capital, Tashkent, which is the fourth largest city by population in the former Soviet Union. But they shut down. They've actually reopened recently. But so they shut down, uh, you know, right in the middle of March. So they started at least... Uh, not for universities, uh, but schools started to have lessons by TV that was gone nationwide. That unfortunately didn't happen for universities. Uh, and many of the students who came to Tashkent, because that's where most of the universities are, they were sent back to their regions. So they were sent back there with poor internet uh, or no internet. In some cases with no electricity, there's been a lot of energy problems in this past winter. And so as, as far as I can see, there was, it was uh, not much uh, uh, that they could do uh, for, uh, for, for study, um, uh, the, the, those rural students. Now they've come back to the capital and they're back, back. But th that's, that's, uh, that's the big problem then is uh, if there, there were some internet uh, studies, people in the urban area like Tashkent have access to those, whereas people in the rural areas didn't. And I think our university is kind of timely in that sense in that we're trying to close that divide in that just to say with our regional centers, we'll be solving the last mile problem because if they don't have Internet in their home, at least they'll have it at the university. Uh, and uh, there'll, there'll be other uh, things possibly being solved, too, such as they can be conservative in the rural areas. They may not want to send their kids, especially their girls, out, out of the region. Uh, so this is a way where they can uh, come to the region. And uh, so I, I think uh, it's something we're trying to do. And I think that the COVID, the positive out of this is that we have a bigger push now to open this university where there maybe was some pushback against it before COVID. And there's a realization that things uh, things have to, to be done to solve this this. Uh, this uh, divide. I'll, I'll just mention one last quick thing about that. During the Soviet system, they had propiskas, which basically means permission. So you were not allowed to move to, you know, the, the party had to give you permission to move. So this was a way to keep people from moving to the main cities. And that kind of system was kind of kept in place in Uzbekistan until the new president took over a few years ago. And now it's kind of being abolished. So. Mm -hmm. You want to have the whole rural people crowding into the cities, and no, you want to help them develop in the rural areas. So I think that this is a, a key thing that uh, everyone is looking at there. Thank you. Um, but, but maybe let's start then with the very practical aspect. You know, my own internet has been terrible this morning. If you <laughs> can't get students to work online, even the best possible content will not reach them. So, Daniel, you've created these sort of hotspots. Kathleen, what does it look like from the US where, you know, obviously we think about this as an emerging market problem, but actually there are um, a lot of people that are also very hard to reach for various reasons in the US. And how, what is the best way of getting around that? How do you get around that? Mm -hmm. um, I, I would say that the, 
that COVID has done a good job of driving this awareness uh, of, of how bad it still is in places in the U.S. where you wouldn't think it was 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 still bad. And so, I I I would say that the you know the the, the most um, the most um, useful uh, you know silver lining, if you will, for COVID has has really been the um, the funding that has been driven. I mean, we just had the largest uh, financial package, um, uh, the, the, the COVID rescue plan that was passed just last week, um, which has um, a, a very large amount of funding uh, for uh, specifically for um, trying to solve some of these problems. And so, you know, we're, I would say in a way we're throwing money at it um, um, in, in a good way. And what COVID did was to, I think, help recognize, I mean, the, the numbers have been staggering of the number of rural students dropping out of college. We already had this huge divide between rural students attending college and the rest of the country, but it was improving. And now, um, uh, you know, just uh, since even uh, in the fall, this past fall, the, 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 the percentage of people uh, who were stopping out, like a third of students were stopping out of college. And we know from statistics that if, um, if they, once they stop out, they don't come back. And so, you know, I think there, it really pulled at people's, um, you know, heartstrings and, and, and set back this huge amount of work that's been done. But I wouldn't say that we have um, brokered solutions on the, on the, on the connectivity piece. The, what we have done is made, you know, like a lot of the other folks are saying on the panel, we've done, we've done a good job of workarounds if you have internet. But if you don't have internet right. and we get you a laptop, we're not, you know, we're, that's, that's not helping. So, I mean, I think it's really just laid bare the, um, the opportunity gap caused by connectivity, even in a country like the U.S. We all need, um, we all need to ram your little box. I was just thinking that, that we should have you speak to our cohort of colleges that are right now um, trying to look at, at solutions. And I think we have a lot to learn from Africa. It's fascinating. And there is obviously a question about live content versus recorded content, which, you know, some of which will all you know, will not be possible. But um, the other thing that has come up a lot and uh, it came up in our previous discussion is is outcomes. Um, so obviously you, you need to get people on the Internet. That's the first problem. Um, the second problem is, is the outcome. So you need them to be employable. You need the content to be appropriate and you need the employers. Actually, there's a lot of interference, and I don't know if it's just at my end, but if anyone has a phone or anything else, please please mute yourself because it's quite hard for us. Um, the So, yes, my, my question is really on the – let's start with the employability side, and we can come to the curriculum um, and discuss a little bit about, you know, a lot of you have been teaching innovation, which I think is a very interesting question, how we teach innovation and in entrepreneurship. But what about the employability? What about convincing the employers – that the outcomes are sufficient, um, that the that the outcomes are uh, desirable, that these are the people that they uh, need and want to employ. And I'd be curious, I mean, Sandeep or Sriram, perhaps I think a couple of you mentioned this in, in previous discussion. I don't know if either of you would like to, to take that on. Uh, yes. Uh, see, uh, as far as uh, uh, higher education in, in, in India goes, majority of the students would be joining for uh, seeking jobs. Uh, yes, a, a large percentage, uh, small percentage has started now uh, getting into entrepreneurships and startups. Uh, however, employability is absolutely the key. And we have done a few little bit of innovations in the last few years, which has worked very well. And what we started doing is uh, starting to work with the industries and develop courses along with them. So these are courses which are co-designed, co-developed, and even <laughs> with the industry as such. So uh, we, are, we are trying to reduce the gap between the academia and the industry since we are giving them what they require. So reverse competency mapping was done and we've been working with companies like IBM, AWS, uh, SAP, Microsoft, uh, and Times Now and into various different, different areas uh, like of... Uh, uh, artificial intelligence, emerging technologies, uh, moving into digital marketing, 
uh, as well as enterprise management. So, and we found that because of these uh, tie-ups, uh, our students got very good placements even during the pandemic. Uh, mm -hmm. So the acceptance level in the industry was very good. If we are adding to our curriculum the, the industry uh, levels and the certifications, cutting-edge certifications coming from the industry as such, well. and coupled with the right skills uh, of critical thinking, innovation, and problem-solving, um, uh, yes, it's it's working well for us. <laughs> sure. And what about so, from an African perspective? And I think I think you have. If I might just ask you to talk as well. You you, you have um, immediate applications so people who are using the courses in order to actually apply it directly in agriculture in particular. How is that working? So I just want to give a context and a perspective. So within the African context, close to about two hundred and fifty million plus smallholder farmers in complete remote areas, completely disconnected. Now, they continue to remain small and they are struggling to have their basic livelihoods met. On an average, they are earning $3 per day income. On the other hand, you have this rural youth who continue to remain unemployed and there are no facilities for higher education. So we reimagined the way education is done. And then we challenged ourselves and said, okay, the, who is, how do we define literacy? The illiterate of the next century is not the one who can't read and write, but the one who is not willing to learn, relearn, and unlearn. So what we managed to do is we've said we brought these two together, the unemployed rural youth and the smallholder farmers, and we created a new cadre called Youth Agripreneurs, Agriculture Entrepreneurs. These are unemployed rural youth, and we set up something called a Youth Ready Program, ready as in REDI, Rural Entrepreneurship Development Incubators. The ready incubators are the ones without four walls. You, under the COVID uh, I mean, uh, times, what we managed to do is to get this going. And these are the rural youth we are connecting with our devices, like I, was, I shared with you earlier. And they are the ones who are doing the assisted learning. So we got about 40 different crops completely digitized in video format pre-COVID time. So these are micro learning videos in two to three minutes on everything about pest management, disease management, nutrition, harvest, all of that in 10 languages. That's made available from these rural agripreneur youth who go around with a backpack and they each of them are engaging about 200 smallholder farmers. Now, in a way, that's how we are democratizing access to the rural education using micro learning video as a means and the youth as a carrier, so the assist people who are able to facilitate and assist them. And that's how we got over half a million smallholder farmers across 4,000 villages who continue to get access to the best practices and also connect to the market to get quality seeds, fertilizers, and access to markets. Thank you. We'll come back to a few of the points that you mentioned. I think the innovation um, in particular, but I was curious, another, another one of the sort of issues that comes up around employability is is when we're dealing with extremely rigid systems, um, mm -hmm. education systems where people are used to having one path. And Daniel, you're dealing in post-Soviet world where obviously there was one path and you do not veer from that path. Um, how do you explain and promote a system which is, you know, from, in many cases user-driven? Um, how do you explain that it is equally valid? Right, well, thank you. Yes, very good question. So, uh, until until uh, last year, there were no private universities in Uzbekistan. Two recently opened up. Uh, there are foreign branches of of um, there are branches of foreign universities, but they're basically all in the capital Tashkent, and they're, they're quite expensive. Most of the population can't afford that, um, so everything else is state run, and the state run institutions tend to be very conservative. And a lot still tend to be heavily based on Soviet methods of education. And um, we also have this issue that people in Uzbekistan tend to study not for the knowledge, but just to get the piece of paper so they can so they can get employed. So you just uh, go through. So uh, this is this is one of the things. And, 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 and uh, somebody mentioned about learning from Africa. I think that's definitely true. We have some other projects that we're doing that are take from Africa and I like uh, love what uh, 
uh, Sriram said about uh, this, this RED that he's doing. That's the kind of thing we would love to do in Uzbekistan. But one of the things, the reasons we're trying to change mentalities. So what we're trying to do is uh, instead of just studying for the, uh, the, the piece of paper, we're trying with these maker spaces and incubators and whatnot in these places is that people start to think about entrepreneurship and innovation and they start to develop and create their own jobs while they're learning. Yes, we want to uh, work with employers and, and, and so on, but we also want that people can think about solving their own uh, community's problems, which, which they know better than me. Uh, and that they, stay, they, they start to get that different change in mentality. And I should also say that, you know, we're, we're starting by offering bachelor's degrees. Oh, oh there you are. Good. Okay. We're, but, you know, I understand that the, the, the education is, is possibly moving away from the degree model into other types of, of, you know, competencies and all that. But we can't change overnight what the people want. They want degrees. So we start with that, and we're going to be initially offering the courses in English, but we are planning to develop the courses in Russian as well and in Uzbek, uh, uh, some courses as well down the road since uh, not everybody speaks English, although it's increasing in its, in its um, uh, level. But most people still speak Russian because the best high schools and elementary schools and um, middle schools – uh, tend to be in the Russian languages, not in the local languages in these countries, and parents want their kids to go to. Not everybody, and the level is dropping, but still. So uh, definitely that's what we're trying to do, and I, I'd love to talk with, with uh, you know, the other panelists off, uh, you know, later on about these, these. All of them had some good points about things for rural education that we would be interested to incorporate into uh, uh, the university, and the courses will be starting fall 2022. So we're definitely trying a different way to get people thinking differently. So how do you do that? <clears throat> how do you teach entrepreneurship? So obviously um, what Sandeep described, the connections with companies has obviously had great impact. It's an extremely good way of getting companies to engage and to tailor the content. But we also know that we have to create new economies. We have to get people to create their own jobs in a way. How do you teach that, especially when you are dealing with, in many cases, quite conservative societies, if not religiously conservative, certainly uh, socially conservative. I wonder, Kathleen, you're looking at this from a slightly different perspective, but again, I'm not sure the issues are that different once we get into some of these education deserts, as you as you refer to it. How do you how do you get people to, in a sense, take, take uh, control of their own destiny, um, but teach something that is very often taught um, in you know with someone else so it's not something that it's it is very hard to teach entrepreneurship just by delivering a video so how how do you do that well, we we have found and, and interestingly uh, entrepreneurship has has emerged as the top uh micro pathway for the rural colleges that we're working with we, we work with urban suburban all kinds of colleges and uh, you know, across the country, we're getting you know, we're seeing themes of of what uh, what we call micro pathways, which is a a collection of of, um, <clears throat> of of credentials that would include industry certificates, but would also include the 21st century skills. Uh, and these are beginning to gain traction in the U.S. as a way to get a a credential that's less than a degree, but more than just an individual industry cert. And so entrepreneurship itself is emerging as one of those micro pathways. And so we're asking uh, this actually during COVID, this exact question, what what goes on that pathway? What should you learn? And what we're seeing really is a mix of, of three things. Really, it's, it's, it's a technical piece which might relate to, you know, HVAC, what we call it. I don't know what, what the term is national, uh, internationally, but it's it's heating and, and uh, air conditioning. Right. So it's a, a trade a trade role. Um, or um, truck driving, um, or you know, or or in some cases, it's like ba a bakery uh, culinary expertise. So, so we're building a technical piece in. We're building a 21st century skill piece in around uh, initiative and uh, collaboration and empathy. Those are three of the skills that have been identified for entrepreneurship in particular. And then the third piece is sort of basic business. Um, well, you know how to run your own business, how to how to market your business. I mean, so th those would be examples of three categories that we are using to make up micro pathways. 
But what we definitely find in rural areas people need in addition is a cohort uh, where they can come together and see other people who are doing this work so they can see themselves, they can see where it can take them. Um, that's a critical piece of it. I'm really interested. That's such a that's such an important point. So you learn from your community as well as, of course, from the institution that is delivering it. True, Ram, you seem to create little communities with your with your box sort of automatically, right? They're all connecting to the same um, the same machine. Does that does is that how it works? And do you how do you how do you find that your delivery is 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 getting through to people the impact that you're having? Given that a lot of what you're producing is is recorded. Yeah. So the two interesting perspectives from the African point of view. Number one, most Africans are entrepreneurs by default and not by design. Mm -hmm. Because they don't have any other possibilities, they tend to become a hustlers. Mm -hmm. Now, what that really means is, uh, and I, I've been a member of entrepreneurs organization for the past 17 plus years. And what I learned being in such groups of uh, most influential communities of entrepreneurs globally is you got to carry your own bags. Entrepreneurship is not something that is taught at school. It's something that you learn <clears throat> as you do mistakes and as you start doing things. So we challenge the basic premise. Kuza Biashara, that's the name of my organization, literally means Kuza means grow, Biashara means business. So we are in the business of helping micro and small entrepreneurs, informal entrepreneurs to grow their businesses. By how do we do it? By helping them to learn with a mentor, connect with a set of their own uh, customers, in this case, smallholder farmers, and grow as a collective. Now, the second thing is the learning need not necessarily happen in a school or a technical vocational school. What we are doing is we are doing in the moment contextual learning. That is, if I'm a small entrepreneur, I'm struggling with something around finance, that's the time I'm willing to learn. And if that is offered in bite-sized micro nuggets, which is extremely contextual in a local language and is made available to them, that's when the aha moment happens. As they start practicing it, as they start seeing some potential income is when they are willing to interest, willing to invest their time and resources behind it. And that's how we managed to scale it to over 6 million plus people across the continent. And I've managed to create over 150,000 plus new jobs. That's, that's amazing. Um, Sandeep, if I can ask you, because you, you have quite a range of, of students that you're trying to reach, how do you manage the online, offline, uh, so the recorded live, um, the, the different kinds of content and what do you find is is at this point most effective most cost effective because obviously that's also a consideration here uh yes uh see the 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 key answer here is blended uh so uh, luckily for us uh, we have been doing blended education we were one of the early adopters from before and uh, we were providing content even from uh, the idea was to bring the best from the world uh, to the Indian audience. So we had our tie-ups with the Harvards or the IIM Bangalore's and we had certain of their co online offerings. Uh, so what, what we started doing uh, very quickly is offering a blend where there are certain things which are taught in a synchronous mode and there is a, a certain activity which a student does later in the asynchronous mode. Uh, so, uh, so we had picked up content coming from the, uh, and the ed tech companies also helped us a lot, like the Coursera or edX, uh, they were offering free credits for our students. Uh, so we, we started, uh, teaching synchronously as well as giving certain coursework and telling the students that these are the modules which you could do offline whenever you have better connections or whether, whenever you could, uh, 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 come up with a place where you could share a device or whatever as such. And that blended thing has really worked. Uh, there is another piece which I would like to put in here. Um, you did talk about the regulations and the constraints. Uh, yes, uh, in India, in India also, we are following the system of affiliated universities where the main university makes the curriculum and the, all the colleges follow that curriculum, which gives a little bit of a lesser flexibility. However, we have decided, we learned that there is no, uh, we can, no one is stopping us from going beyond the curriculum. 
and uh, that's that is what has helped and the new national education policy which has just come up now in india after 35 years is going to be a game changer it's going to completely redefine and restructure the way education is done it is giving multiple choice uh, yeah, it's opening up multiple languages options with multiple entry and exits also which can be an absolutely game changer so you don't need to completely do the four year five year degree at a stretch you could join for a semester you could take a break you could start your company join back and not only your this current institute you could go anywhere else and also gives you an option to learn any of the subjects as such so it's it's an amazing thing which has happened and it's exciting times here in india now <laughs> Well, that does certainly sound very appropriate, particularly for a, a fast-moving market where often people are working and studying um, to, to be able to, to dip in and out. One thing that you mentioned, I think, in the, previously, and Daniel, I'd, I'd really like your perspectives. I think you're working on some of this right now is the connections with existing institutions to try and support what you are doing um, with existing, you know, whether it's it's the Harvards of the world or, 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 or local institutions. How, how necessary is that and, and how beneficial has that been to you? Great, Clara. I'll, I'll answer that in one second. I just want to make one quick point about the previous question that you asked. They mentioned blended learning. That's exactly what we're trying to do while we have these centers. Uh, we're going to have tutors there. And there's a lot of Uzbeks who, in the, under the previous regime, got masters, PhDs um, abroad in the West, in Korea, in Asia, you name it, in Europe. And coming back, a lot of them want to come back or are coming back, and we plan to utilize uh, that talent, that human capital uh, at all of our, our centers. Um, I agree about the cohorts, and that's why we also, we have the center, even though it's gonna be blended and online, we want, you know, the loneliness people drop out, we want them to, to be studying to get, uh, uh, together, coming to the center and all that. So we hope that will uh, help, yes. So actually, this is this is a very good issue because the government initially told us that we could issue our own diplomas, and then they changed that on us. So we've been looking for a while for a a, a foreign uh, co-issuer of, of the degrees. And of course, why would a reputable university want to deal with no names like us? So we had that problem for a while. Luckily. Um, the, the, the former head of tertiary education, the World Bank, had worked on a project in Uzbekistan with my main interlocutor, and we were able to use his name. And that's how we're in talks for almost a year with a major uh, American university, top 100, top 50, uh, 150. Um, and I believe next week we're getting the binding agreement with them. So they're going to help us tremendously because they already have the learning platform and they've, they've themselves have done this in other countries. They've opened such type of university uh, in other countries already. Um, and so they're going to have their ready coursework. And so, yes, a lot of it is going to be pre-recorded, but, but, but like we said, we're going to be working with the tutors. So the local people right there. So there's going to be a lot of stuff that's going to be done in house as well at the regional center. So it's not just going to be recorded stuff and, and sitting, sitting at home or wherever it's pre recorded and all that. So we definitely, I mean, it was a demand of the government that for us to do this, we brought an outside partner. And we, so we're definitely bringing this outside partner. And what I should say though is that, uh, as I mentioned, while the initial coursework is going to be in English, we are going to be developing materials in Russian and in Uzbek and, you know, things that are, how should I say, locally appropriate. I think a lot of that will be maybe additional stuff that will be done with the tutors if it's not done from, from the outside partner. But for, for us, the outside partner is critical. I mean, for us to do our own, you know, learning management system, to figure out our own courses and do this and do that would just be beyond the scope of, of what we can do right now, both in terms of human capital and in terms of uh, a monetary uh, outlay. So yes, we're gonna be doing a monetary outlay, but it's certainly much less than if we were to do all this from ourselves. So for us, at least, we wouldn't have been able to do this project without an outside uh, uh, provider. Kathleen, I'd be really interested in the US, how uh, have you been able to connect community colleges, which very often, 
um, people consider to fit in a very specific space. And what I think everyone has been trying to do is to obviously broaden that perception. You know, it, they can be beneficial to so many more people to, to sort of bridge the gap between the community colleges and, and the universities. And are there any of these sort of links and, and partnerships? Oh, you need to unmute, I'm afraid. <laughs> Thank you. Got it. Sorry. Um, in the in the rural context, uh, it's it's quite different than in the urban or suburban context in the U.S. because um, so few people do go on to earn a four year degree, and there are few four year degree institutions in rural areas. Um, and there's still, you know, really this stigma about college uh, for a lot of rural families. Uh, it's not considered the thing to do in in so many in so many um, families, and and we feel like COVID actually uh, worsened that, uh, you know, that, that decision-making process as people uh, turn to work, they don't want to necessarily do it online or they don't have the connectivity. Um, and, and so um, uh, we're, we're, we're seeing community college as, as, a, as a, a group that can potentially be uh, a community partner because they have been seen as that outsider almost in a rural community um, uh, in, in many ways. And that's one of the things in the work that we're doing. We're running a cohort right now, a design, national design project, which is, I think, why I'm on this panel uh, with um, uh, five community colleges from across the country. And we're analyzing what, you know, what is it that uh, about the way that uh, you interact with your community that isn't working or what are the potential? Let's do, let's do the asset mapping together to figure out how do we, how do we change the dynamic? And, and COVID actually presents an opportunity uh, in that regard. And so I think to answer your question, yes, in most parts of our country, there is a really interesting, uh, you know, I would say renaissance going on around connecting the two year to the four year and, and creating a more seamless pathway. We're doing a lot of that work too. In, in the rural communities, it's, it's more about rethinking what is college and how can community college be a partner? What is not working? I'm curious when you ask these colleges, <clears throat> what is not working in their connections with community? Um, the, the the sense that it, it feels like an otherness, like there's not a belonging, that the community in community college doesn't exist. It's an other place that takes you away if you succeed, um, potentially. I mean, and I'm, of course, I'm generalizing. I mean, there's so many different types of rural family and rural area in, in the U.S. that you can't, you really shouldn't generalize, but, you know, I, I'm, I'm doing it just for the, I realize we're near the end of the panel. <laughs> no, that's, that's very helpful. I suspect it's not just an issue for the U.S. For many people, the, the education, you have to explain that it's part of the community and not something that will just take you away. If, if I might, if I might, uh, just in the last few minutes, uh, sure, I might be really curious to start with you, but it's a general question, uh, which is the role of policy. You know, what can policymakers, what can governments you know, a lot of what you were doing is sort of self-starter stuff, um, really getting people to solve their own destinies. But it can also be facilitated by government. Uh, it can be facilitated or, or um, as Daniel has shown, it can also be made quite difficult um, on occasion. Um, but I wondered, what would you recommend? I mean, what can governments in African countries, for example, but well beyond that, do to facilitate um, what you were trying to do and widen um, the access to education at every level? No, that's a great question. And <clears throat> the way I look at it is, as they say, it takes a village. The approach that we are taking is uh, we are taking an ecosystem modeling and government plays an extremely important role in bringing all the key stakeholders together. And we work very closely with the local government, national government by kind of because they play a role of uh, crowding in the right set of actors. And the ecosystem model that we managed to put together is where we are bringing in the private sector who seem to have a lot of practical solutions, academia, research, and most importantly, government and the multilaterals and donors who are coming in there. So that's the, that's the kind of a model that we are taking. And because there are problems and there are also solutions available locally, all we got to do is to connect them in a way by bringing these partnerships together. We believe one plus one can become 11. Well, I, I am going to um, finish up on that extremely positive uh, note, having started you off on something a little more negative. I'd like to thank you all very much uh, for joining us today. Sandeep, Daniel, Shriram, Kathleen, thank you so much for sharing 
um, everything that you've been uh, working on and and, uh, and and so much of what you've learned from the past extremely challenging year. And uh, I wish you all the great uh, rest of the day, evening, wherever you are. Thank, Thank you. you very much. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.